Welcome, everyone. I'm delighted this afternoon to um, welcome Kathleen Turner, who is the Drexel Librarian for Public Health, Psychology, Criminology, and Justice Studies, uh, with whom I have worked for many years. And historically, Kathleen and I would do uh, a webinar as part of CHIP 671, Community Organizing and Community Assessment course. And we would do it as an in-class in uh, webinar to provide information and do a little training for our MPH students on how to access US Census data and American Community Survey data. And now that CHIP 671 is an asynchronous course, I asked Kathleen if she would uh, be willing to continue to offer this webinar as a recorded webinar. So um, we're co-offering -off it, but Kathleen is the uh, expert who is actually doing the webinar. So Kathleen, I wanna thank you once again for all the ways that you contribute to our public health uh, community to our public health uh, students. And um, as part of our work in CHIP 671, we focus on both community organizing and community assessment. And in particular, we use a framework called Action-Oriented Community Diagnosis, AOCD. And you'll be reading all about AOCD in the course. And one aspect of community assessment and AOCD is knowing how to access existing secondary data, data that has been collected from other sources that is available to you as a public health professional to understand communities, neighborhoods, census tracts, and there are many different data sets available today. In particular today, we're also going to focus on something called policy map, which is a way, a tool, a framework within which to pull together data and visually represent that. It's a very exciting tool. It's a wonderful thing that's available to the public health world and others. And uh, so I want to thank Kathleen again for offering and presenting this webinar, which we will also make available to other colleagues uh, at Drexel to be able to use as well. So um, thank you, Kathleen, and I turn it over to you and thank you to those who are joining us today as our live audience. Handing it off to you, Kathleen. All right, thank you, Dr. Epstein. Um, in previous years, as Dr. Epstein mentioned, we have done, um, we've done work with the community health, community health program, looking at using census data to examine a community. Policy map gives us a different way to connect, not only with census data, but um, a whole range of additional data sets about an area or a community or a neighborhood. And the fun thing about policy map is it really lets you start, you can think of it as using a visual map as your search engine. You can define on a map what the area is that you want to look at and then browse through the policy map data warehouse, um, which has over 50,000 indicators to find the information that will be useful to you about the area that you're looking at. And then once you find that data, the other fun thing about policy map is that it helps you make colorful illustrations of the data. And as everybody has heard that, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, 
A colorful map is probably worth 10,000 words. Um, so we're going to look at the different ways that you can use policy map to find data and then to illustrate different information about the data that you found. Now policy map is actually available for use by anyone, but there are features and data sets that are only available to subscribers. So the Drexel Library subscribes to data map on behalf of the university. So the easiest way to get to it is start at the library homepage, go to our databases A to Z list to the P's and open up policy map. And let me switch over to sharing it with you now so you can see what it looks like. And this is the point that always makes me a little nervous. Is it going to work? <laughs> And there we go. So now we're looking at policy map. Now, this is what it will look like when you first connect. And the first thing that I would recommend that you do when you get into policy map is create your own account for it or log, log in if you've already created one. You can use a lot of the features without logging in But creating your own account makes your own workspace where you can save maps that you've created. You can save customized regions that you've identified. Um, and you can go back and find work that you've done previously. Very. So to do that, there's really just a little create account or login button up at the corner and from then on, policy map will recognize you. Now, before we actually start looking at the map, as I mentioned, policy map is really built on top of a data warehouse. So just to get a picture of the kind of data that it has available, again, up at the very corner for the data directory, Okay, we had a little glitch there for a second. Um, and as you scroll down through it, you can see that they've got data in categories of demographics. Um, income, housing, lending activity, quality of life, and so on. And for each different data category, the data directory shows you whether it's available on the public or the subscribed interface for policy map and what years of data are available and what the different geographies are for which you can find different data. So there might be some data points that are available um, to as small an area as a census block group, which you can usually think of as maybe four to six city blocks. There are other data points that you might only be able to find on the county level or even the state level. So if you've got questions about finding particular kinds of data and what might be available, Take a look at the data directory um, just to get an, a feel for what the geography is that you can use with different data elements. Now, let me get back to our map here. There we go, and I'm still logged in. So as I mentioned, you can think of policy map as using a location as part of a search interface for data. So usually the first step that you want to take is to identify 
the area that you want to look at. So the search bar at the top for location, you can pull it down and you can see that there's a lot of different types of areas that you can specify. You can look for a census tract, um, which is actually very tricky. And I'll show you a trick to doing that. State districts, metropolitan areas. But most of the time, you can really just start typing in what you're looking for. And it will suggest how to define that area and what it is. So if we say we're looking for the 19129 zip code, the first question that you have to look at is, are you looking actually looking for a zip code? Or are you looking for a zip code tabulation area? And this is something I learned when I started working with census data, that technically the post office defines a zip code as a route, the streets that a mail carrier would follow to deliver mail in that area. So you can't really draw boundaries defined by a route. So the, the census takes those zip code routes and call, turns them into what they called zip code tabulation areas or ZICTAs for short. So that's what we're actually going to look at so that we can have a nice boundary area. And as you can see, 19129 is actually a zip code in the East Falls section of Philadelphia. I decided to pick on something other than West Philadelphia or Kensington today, which we've usually looked at in the past. Now, as you can see, my map has automatically zoomed in. I've got a nice boundary around that area. And then I can either use the search function or look at all of the data categories across the top of the page to decide on the demographic that I want to look at. So let's think of interesting things we can look at about the 19129 area code. So if we start with demographics, let's start out by looking at race. And we could choose one of the specific categories here but let's take a look at just population of color. Now, what this is going to show us is for this zip code area, what are the percentages of people in different units of that area that are people of color. Now, if you look at the data layer legend over here in the corner, and this is a data layer because it's about laying information on top of our map. We'll also take a look at what they call point data, which is basically specific places within your map boundaries. So we're looking at data from 2015 to 2019. The source is from the US census, as we would expect. It's going to show the variables to us as percent. We could change that. Mm. Either look at change over five years or raw numbers. Let's stick with percent. And the shading we can do by block group, by census tract, which is generally maybe 10 block groups or so, or we could move up to broader categories of looking at a whole zip code area, 
a city, county, and so on. Let's keep that at block group because that's the smallest unit we can see for this. Generally, block group is the smallest unit that you're going to be able to see for most data because if you start getting smaller than that, you can probably start identifying specific households. Right. And that gets into privacy issues. So then we've got our legend down here with the ranges. And not being a statistician, I will say that um, they have an algorithm that they use for establishing the ranges, but you can alter them if you want. If you, for some reason, wanted to see zero to 10%, you could change this and then change all of the categories above it. You can also, if you want to be picky, change the selection of colors. So we switched from purple to green. But let's just take a look at this in area. I'm trying to make this legend go away, but um, zoom in a little bit more. It's very easy to see some really immediately clear things. If you look at this whole orange outlined area that you go from an area here that is less than 8% people of color to areas over here. This is Roosevelt Boulevard, a Roosevelt Expressway. If you're familiar with Philadelphia to know what this area is. And if you look at that zip code south of Roosevelt Boulevard, you've got really 70% or more people of color. And then you've got a little bit more variation in the other two sections of this zip code. So right away, this is telling you that although there may be some variation within the zip code, you really have some very strongly segregated neighborhoods going on here. So if we wanted to look at another demographic factor or another data factor about this area. What if we looked at housing costs? So looking under housing, and we're just going to look at median value. And again, the legend is telling us that it's given us some rather strange ranges. And again, we could adjust those. We're looking at median dollars and we're looking again by block group. And it's interesting that you see almost the same segregation of areas this way, um, but you've got a big hole here where it's telling you insufficient data. Well, what would really explain that is this legend here, that most of this area is either industrial, um, oh no, actually the old Tasty Cake plant mm -hmm. was down here. Um, most of this area is actually a public housing area. And we could look at that if we go back to housing and look under data points, that we can ask it to show us any HUD public housing locations. And it's hard to see, but it's these two little mm -hmm. boys colored points here. 
So this one, if we click on it, tells us that this is the Ab Abbotsford Homes. And it's got nearly 500 residents. We can actually open up more data about this public housing facility. Um, looking at the average household size, average income, senior headed households, and so on. Incidentally, the other piece here that's blocked out and doesn't have housing information is the old Medical College of Pennsylvania campus. So there's no, um, there's no housing in that area. Now, the other interesting that, thing that we could look at here is not just median dollars, but where has been, where there has been the greatest change over the past five years. Mm -hmm. Because often looking at static information about an area will tell you one thing. But if you can look at dynamic information, how has it changed in five years? Mm -hmm. You can learn quite a bit more. So one of the things that you can see is that some sections of this zip code have actually had slight decreases in housing value. Some have had pretty substantial increases over the last five years. And others, these in dark green, a little bit outside of our zip code boundary, but still worth looking at, have had really substantial jumps, more than 40% increase in the housing values in the last five years. Wow. Which starts to get into interesting questions about affordability and are people being squeezed out of their homes? Now, when you're looking at a map like this, and again, let me move that down a little bit in size. You're looking, we're looking at the area that we're interested in, but all of the surrounding area is also colored as well. One of the useful features that Policy Map does is that when you're ready to print a copy of your map, and when I say print, you might just be saving it to a JPEG or a PDF so that you can use it later. I somehow never think of printing as actually putting things on paper anymore. But one of the features that the printing function lets you do is to cut out the selection that you're interested in. Wow. So the rest of the map stays there, but only the section that you were, that you identified as your area of interest keeps the colors. So th this obviously would make a much better illustration for your paper or your PowerPoint presentation than trying to look at this whole screen and yeah. pull out the one section that's really of interest to you. And as you do that, I'm thinking about the power of a picture, right? Yes. So much more than words or data on the screen and then the power of a map with gradients being worth, as you said earlier, like 10,000 pictures. It's amazing. It's mm -hmm. continually exciting. And of course, you know, again, being able to play with the colors and the ranges for your data layer, you can not only play with how many or what the values of the ranges are, but you could look at your data and decide, this is really more effective if I just show it in three ranges instead of five. Oh, wow. Often be cluttering. Wow. 
but maybe you look at five and say, well, you know, that's really not quite granular enough. So let's see what happens if we go to four. So there's really a lot of variation that you can use in this. Kathleen, a quick question. Does the person working with policy map get to decide the color of the boundary they want in terms of how that shows on the map? You know, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure whether there is a way to change a boundary in this mode. Yeah. I know that when you're working with custom regions, which we will get to in a minute, you can. Interesting. Um, Thank you. Thank you. So I, was, I was thinking of like hot pink, you know, so it really yes. just goes. Pow. Well, that actually leads to the next piece. <laughs> Great. Um, you know, it's nice to be able to look at a region by census tract or zip code or whatever category you want to use. But very often um, when you're trying to show you know, when you're trying to research an area, mm -hmm. you might be thinking of a neighborhood and that neighborhood might not fit neatly within a zip code. Exactly. Neatly within census tract boundaries. So policy map actually lets you create your own custom areas. So we're going to come down here and look at the options for doing that. You can create a custom region by drawing it, basically clicking different areas on a map. You can create a custom area by assembling it, which would mean basically saying, I want this zip code and this zip code and this zip code, or this census tract and this census tract. Or you can do a radius which would usually be starting with a location mm. and drawing a one mile or a two mile or a five mile circus around it, Cir circle. So imagine doing that, for example, with a hospital and creating a radius region around the hospital yeah. to find the area that it serves. So let's look at assembling a custom region. So I'm going to choose that, and then it's going to tell me all about how to do it. Policy map is very good at telling you how to do things. Now up here in the corner, I can choose how I'm going to select the areas on my map. If I wanted to do it to look at a smaller neighborhood area, maybe I would want to do it by block group. Mm -hmm. If I wanted to look at a larger area, maybe I want to do by zip code. So let's say I want to look at 19129 and some of its surrounding zip codes. So all I have to do is click on them to select them. Sometimes it's a little slow responding. There we go. All right, so it's telling me up here, I've got four zip codes selected and I can either say that that is what I want and I can clear it and start over again, or I can save that whole region and give it a name.
and a description. And down here at the bottom, I have a link for all of my saved regions. And when I go into that, I can open them up. I can share them to other people. I can edit them. Or I can choose it as the area that I want to look at. So our map has zoomed out a little bit so that the whole region can show here. And sometimes you have to look carefully. There's a little red icon. And if you click on that, it lets you do some editing, including changing the color of your boundary to hot pink. <laughs> oh, and that really jumps out. Then you really, yes. really see the area. It wow. also lets you change the tra transparency of the region that you're looking at or of the boundary you're looking at. What does that mean, the transparency? Just making, making the boundary lighter or darker. Oh, that's what I thought, great. All right, I've got, there we go. I was a little nervous for a minute there. Um, we had a couple of power outages here yesterday afternoon and I've been keeping wow. my fingers crossed. Wow. So we've got a much bigger region to work with now. But let's think of some other interesting things that we can do with it. We've got one data layer that we've been looking at and a data point. Let's close those out and look at what happens when we try to make a three layer map. Now this is essentially letting you look at three, um, three data layers simultaneously. And it, it gets a little tricky and sometimes a little bit confusing because what a three layer data map really lets you do is define three different data criteria and shows you the regions on the map that meet all three. So sometimes you have to be a little careful in how you're defining your data criteria and how you're looking at them. So let's start out with this area here and say that we are interested in looking at, um, we want to develop some kind of services for older, rel older residents who have been diagnosed with diabetes. Mm. So, start with our demographics and age, and we're looking at 65 or older, although I'm starting to feel more resistance to defining 65 as older these days. <laughs> now, it turned my whole map purple because right now my range for that is defined as anywhere from zero to 100% of the residents are 65 or older. So obviously any area meets that criteria. Sure. So let's say that we want to look at areas where at least 70, at least 50% of the residents 
are 65 or older. Well, now we've got nothing showing on our map. So we can move these ranges again. And we can say, let's say about 25% to 100%. So now we have a couple of different areas highlighted in purple. And incidentally, we can look at this layer and we can double check. Are we looking at census tract or are we looking at block group? And what this is showing us is that it wasn't giving us data by block group right now because our map is zoomed out a little too far. Mm -hmm. if we come up here to our map slider, the arrow actually shows us the point at which we can do block group analysis for that area. So now we've got areas where roughly 25% or more of the residents are 65 or older, defined in purple. So now let's add the next layer on. And we'll go to the health section and we want to look for chronic conditions and we're looking for people diagnosed with diabetes. So again, we've got um, an explanation of the data. We've got information where, of where it came from. And we'll come back to that. That's an important thing to keep an eye on. We can look again at how we're defining the area. And this isn't going any narrower than census tract. So that's what we'll have to stick with for this. Mm -hmm. And let's say that we want, we want to look at areas where at least 10% of the residents have been diagnosed with diabetes um, in, in 2018, because that's the year our data is coming from. And we still have most of the same areas defined. But we probably can't help noticing that there is an area up here where there's a pretty substantial section Mm -hmm. that's meeting both of our criteria. We could continue looking at this whole area here, but this is also a place where we could say, all right, I wanted to just zoom in and look very specifically mm -hmm. at this area up here that meets my criteria. And this is where I can go back and create a drawn region for myself. By saying, I'm going to start here. Okay, there's my first point. And basically, I'm just going to follow the outline of this purple area. I should have picked an easier step. You know what? Let's just make this shape easier. We're just going to go to here. 
and back up to here to finish. And there is my new region that I'm interested in. And again, I can change the color. We can make this one a nice bright green. And now I could decide what, what demographic data um, or what other types of data I'm interested in looking in about this region. Mm. And probably one of the things that I would want to start with under quality of life is what kind of food stores are available. So may I ask a quick question? Uh-huh. So basically you're establishing a floor of what your first and second level or even first, second and third level uh, criteria are. And that's giving you uh, the areas that here are being shown in purple. And now you can go back into that area, you've customized it, and you can begin to go even deeper, mm -hmm. looking at other levels of data within that same customized geographic area. Is that right? Right. What I might want to do from here is even close out those different da data layers so that I can look at other other data elements related just to this specific region I'm interested in. Interesting. So I used those data layers to identify an area that might be of interest to me. There you go. But now I can look more closely at different factors. And you can also clear out what's around it so that it really stands out and is very uh, visual in terms of contrast. Right, in this yeah. version, I can, do, I can only do that when I'm printing. Got I'll it. give you a quick preview of the beta version in a minute. Wow. You can actually do that while you're working. So you exciting. Cut out the area. Um, what I just wanted to show with data points like grocery retail locations we've chosen is that there's often options for filtering them. Wow, that's amazing. So we could look at grocery retail type and you can see all of these different choices. And you will notice that many of the grocery retail locations right here are actually dollar stores. Wow. So if I click on any of those points again, it gives me specific information about what that point is. Mm -hmm. About a family dollar, a dollar general, you know, which are great places for buying cheap things, but they certainly don't have fresh produce or fruit. Mm-hmm generally not your healthiest food choices. Yeah. Um, just a couple of other quick things here. Map boundaries. There are defaults that it's always going to show you, but you can also choose to look at additional boundaries. Um, this version will show you public transit rail lines, but they are very specifically only the rail lines. The beta version also includes bus lines. Um, you'll notice that there's a much more granular boundaries that you can open up for Philadelphia here. Um, and part of that is we have the enormous advantage that the people who developed policy map we're in Philadelphia. Yeah. So they will show us things like school catchment areas in Philadelphia, 
which can have an enormous effect on home values, mm -hmm. political wards, political divisions. So if I wanted to see what the different voting wards are in the area that I'm looking at, I can turn those boundaries on. You can see them in black here. So there's a lot of flexibility with this. There's a lot of fun you, that you can have with it. I'm gonna take a minute now and just jump to the new beta version, just to show you some of the features that aren't quite ready for prime time, but are going to do some very cool things when they are. So let me see if this will open up. I found this morning that once I had done a lot of mapping, the beta version wouldn't open. So I'm just opening up a new screen. And now we can go to the beta version. And of course it tells you what a lot of the features are. As you can see, you've got just some different layout for finding data, for finding locations. Um, just for the sake of comparison, I'm going to go back to the same place. And we're just going to put one data layer on this. We'll go back to medium housing value. We'll zoom in a little bit because this is where I can clip my boundary. So now only the area that I'm interested in is highlighted in color. Mm -hmm. It also gives me some additional choices. This is not of quite so much interest for a city but I can switch this to satellite view. Wow. Or to other types of layout. Wow. As I mentioned, it also adds in bus routes, hmm. which certainly when you're looking at city neighborhoods is a very important thing to know. And I can tell you from years of taking it that this is the old 32 bus that runs up Henry Avenue and up to Ridge. Now, one of the disadvantages with the beta version right now is that you can't save anything. So while it's fun to play with and see what the possibilities are, for the time being, plan on doing any of your real work in the current version, because that's where you can take the work that you've done and you can save it so that you can come back to it later. You can get a link to share it with someone else. It won't share a custom region there. And one of the other important features to keep in mind, and I have to mention this as a librarian, it also gives you information about how to cite your map. Oh, that's fabulous. So I mentioned before that when you're looking at your data layers, it's important to pay attention to the sources because when you're citing your map, What you're actually doing, and it gives you great APA style examples here, is citing the source of your data, the actual table that you look at, the date of the data, and then a link back to your map. So if I were going to use this in a paper, I would need to make sure that I'm providing this information and obtaining a link 
to the map that I've created so that I've cited this correctly. And policy map produces the link at the end for- everything. Policy map produces a link for you. Wow, you don't have to request it, it comes automatically? Yes, it does. That's amazing. This whole thing is amazing. It's fun. You can spend hours and hours. I'm just going to say, you could spend all your time exploring on this. All right. Um, so questions. I'd like to invite Caroline Voiles, one of our colleagues, a, a doctoral student and a project manager now over in the Department of Sociology. Caroline, do you have any questions? Yeah, and I, I have another meeting to run to, but um, but really quickly, I would like to know, yeah, how often is this updated with new data sources and and things like that? Um, constantly. Mm. In fact, um, if you go to the data directory, which is a little being a little slow opening up, there's always a list on the side where you can download, you know new data sets or recently updated data sets. Yes, I had, I had a similar question. How often is it updated and then how recent is it? So it sounds like it's really the most recent data available and it's constantly being updated. Now, you know, now of course it, it depends on the source that you're looking at. Or um, if you're looking at census data, um, most of what they're showing us here for census data would actually be coming from the American Community Survey. Mm -hmm. The latest numbers from that are generally from 2018. Mm -hmm. Actual demographic census, of course, the decennial census, the 2010 data is the latest that's available probably within the next six months or so, the unfortunately, probably not very accurate 2020 census data will start being available. Um, but that will be coming in slowly as it's all processed. Yeah, that was my next question. That's kind of unveiled over time, right? Right. They clean the data and present that data. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the questions that I have, Kathleen, is um, does the user select the data set or if you're going to, let's say, housing, is the policy map selecting multiple data sets or is it automatically choosing the data set under those topics or are you choosing the data set? Generally... Policy map is choosing the specific data set that has that element available. Okay. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of whether I've encountered anywhere where there might be multiple data sources available. Um, Do you think on, on demographics perhaps or health? You know, there might be the, the biannual regional Philly PHMC data and federal data uh, around healthcare or chronic illness perhaps. There might be additional sources. Um, I'm just picking. I, I will say that I haven't really encountered any. Um, but I will also say that I haven't come close to investigating oh, uh, of all course. the different oh. data areas that are available. Um, you could probably spend, you know, at least a week 
digging into all of the different data options. There are also, again, the emphasis on this is starting with the map and looking at things that way, but it's also possible to actually look at tables created by the data that you're looking at. Amazing or at their lists of pre-created reports. Um, things like their community profiles mm -hmm. that would let you define an area that you're interested in. Wow and look at a community profile for that location. And the community profile here gives you school districts, population trends, age distribution, immigration, basically all of the data that they can pull together in one place about the community that you've defined. This is really such an extraordinary tool and also, right, accumulation of data sets. When I think about, uh, you know, how we used to go into the US census to look at census data, which is an actual count, as well as to go into the American Community Survey, which is a survey to gather data, it was much more, um, I can't think of the right word, but it was a, a much drier, way, mm -hmm. right, that the mapping by itself is so dynamic. And all the ways that you've presented that the data can be presented visually and geographically and really in terms of community assessment, the starting place is what's your geography? Well, if it's neighborhood oriented, you know, of course there's online, right. things, but in turn, what's your geography? So as I think about how our students can use this, you know, and many of our students uh, are working in different places in Philadelphia and the region and now global MPH in the world, to really start, are you looking at national data? Are you looking at state data? Are you looking mm -hmm. at county data? Are you looking at Philadelphia data? For Philly, we're also a city and a county. Is it neighborhood? Is it zip code? As you said, is it zipta? Is it yes. census tract? Is it block group? And you can go so small and then you can build back out. Um, it's virtually Being able to take that data from different sources yes. and layer it on layer it on top of each other. Um, The other thing, I, you know, one of the things that I absolutely love about it is the ability to, you know, either by drawing or, um, you know, collecting pieces, define the area that you're looking at. Um, one of the things that I find amusing with policy maps and you know, this is something that I think we've talked about. As I mentioned, they do provide a lot of very specific Philadelphia area Philadelphia areas. They have even made some attempts to define Philadelphia neighborhoods. Although you, if you'll notice looking at the map, yeah, do it by labeling, but not by drawing boundaries. That's very astute. I about yeah. this when we were looking yeah. at your West Kensington area is yeah. probably could not get any two people in Philadelphia to agree on the boundaries of any given neighborhood. Yes, yes. So You're this would let you pick the neighborhood that you're interested in yeah, and draw your own boundaries. Yes. You know, I'm thinking back to a, a, 
a very comprehensive community assessment and action-oriented community diagnosis that we did um, now eight, nine years ago in the lower Northeast. And one thing, as you're talking about, as we interviewed, we interviewed about 130 people and did extensive data collection and looking at secondary data and focus groups. There was disputes by people who had been born in Philly, lived in different neighborhoods. What do we mean by the lower Northeast? Right. Some people would say that's not the lower Northeast. Other people would say, of course, it's the lower Northeast but we didn't have access to tools like this. So as we were looking at, we looked at five zip codes and we did almost all the work manually by hand, looking at you know, the PHMC biennial survey and the census data, but being able to go into the neighborhood level was so challenging. And as we're, you know, I've been teaching community health and community assessment for a long time. And this is is such an extraordinary tool because not only do you not have to go into the individual data sets, but just as you've demonstrated so beautifully, you go into the mapping. And as you talked about the layers, the layers of the data are built into the policy map framework and it makes it so easy for us mm-hmm. in community health endeavors to be able to find existing and comprehensive uh, and very detailed data at the neighborhood level and at the larger level and at the smaller level. So what an extraordinary set of tools we've got here. Incidentally, one, and I think we'll make this one last thing, um, As we looked at the data directory, there is an extensive range of sources that their data comes from. I don't think PHMC is one of them because their data is proprietary. That's right. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, But if you have your own data about a particular area, an extensive survey or study, if you have your own data, as long as it has location identification, you can actually upload it into policy map for your own use. It isn't automatically shared with others. Um, Now that's not something that I've done, but they do provide extensive assistance with properly formatting your data so that you can upload it and then use policy map to illustrate it. Wow. And, you know, I'm thinking what a rich set of resources um, this is and these are and you are to our Dornside School of Public Health and other students who are, um, you know, taking our courses As our program is expanding, you know, with our global MPH, we've got students now all over the world. And um, this is a fabulous, really fabulous set of tools. And I, I wanna just name that we are recording this towards the end of April in um, 2021. And just at a time when the federal government here in the United States is just beginning to talk about releasing the first uh, sets of data soon uh, from the 2020 census. And so uh, as that begins to unfold, we'll have a lot more to learn And I think the timing for this um, webinar today is really so timely, uh, given that that really that information was on the front page of yesterday's paper and in the news. It will be very interesting to look at changes. Yes. In the 2010 and 2020. Yes. Yes. So Kathleen, any last words of, uh, encouragement, guidance to our students who will be watching this 
Uh, our CHIP 671 students will have this as part of their assigned reading and what, video watching uh, in the next few weeks. And um, any, any last watch words, encouragement, guidance? Only my usual plug that whether it is related to policy map or um, any other research resources that you might be using, if you need any assistance, if you get stuck on anything, get in touch with me. Um, I'm not in my office. I'm here in my dining room. Uh -huh. um, you can reach me by email. You can reach me through the library website. Um, and I always welcome questions from students. So oh, you, you're, you're, so, but you're such a marvelous resource. Can you tell us what your email is? Yes. Um, K.H. Turner at drexel.edu. Okay. Is the one that I K.H. Turner at drexel.edu. So students, I encourage you. Kathleen has been uh, such a generous resource to me and so many of my faculty colleagues and so many of our students and program and research staff. Um, we really want to thank you, Kathleen, for uh, the planning that went into this, the uh, producing this webinar. And I know it's going to be a great, great uh, tool and resource for many of our students. So again, you have my deep gratitude and thanks and really on behalf of well, you're, our You're school. very welcome and thank you for joining me today. Oh, my pleasure. Okay, thank you again. Bye. Bye-bye.